We didn't just suddenly wake up one morning and we had the Xbox. We didn't wake up one morning and the internet was there. You know, how did we get there? That's what you want to know about history for. Oh, are we uh, ready to roll? Yeah, we're rolling. What I have next to me is uh, the first uh, bulletin board in the world, uh, CBBS Chicago. Uh, people wondered if the C stood for Christensen or Chicago or whatever, and, uh, and no, it didn't because there was no such thing as a BBS, so it was a computerized bulletin board system. I would, I would enthusiastically describe it to everybody. I'd be telling you know, my relatives, I'm like, so this is, I, I, I would dial up and I'd be talking to other people online, but not really talking, I'd be typing and, and leave the messages and then later I can read more messages and they all go, oh, okay, and they look like you've got some sort of disease or something. I say it's kind of like America Online, but really scaled down, you know? <laughs> and it, it, it's, it's not an easy thing to explain. But this program you'd have on your computer, you'd dial a number, and you'd enter your name and password, and it would say hello, and then you could go to the messages, and you could read these messages. And then you could add one. And if you waited long enough, and I had to say months, other people would have called in, and left messages, and after a few months, you have a conversation. And they're like, why? <laughs> you know, they're all in their early 20s, and it's like, well, that's stupid. I mean, you know, it, and it is stupid. It was unbelievably stupid. I, I try telling it to people now, I'm like, imagine AI, you know, AIM is down, and all of your buddies are gone. Your buddy list is empty, and you can't talk to anybody. And there's no email. And people don't quite get how bad that would be. In a way, it's it's the next generation of things that have always been around. The way the early telegraph stuff worked was they would have uh, people walk into the counter and they're leaving all these messages, you know, handwritten messages, and someone goes over to the punch and they, with two fingers, punch a tape that's got the message. And then the guy in the back room of the office puts a little header on it. I've seen pictures of there's a rack with the tapes hanging from them, like dog leashes on a, on a coat rack. And they tape them all together, and they put them into readers, and they're all transmitted over to some central routing place. And then they'll look at the numbers and they'll say, oh, this one, it's got the little, the funny little codes that says OAK for Oakland. And so then they would put the tape in the right reader and they'd route, so they're doing manual routing. So yeah, there's hardly any new things. I'm sure these guys were sending stuff, not for customer consumption. Because we know, because I have, we have a lot of teletype in uh, Western Union documentation and machinery. And we know that they inserted inter-office messaging in the stream. There's meta messages in the stream. Between, how could they not chat? You know, science fiction fandom, going back to the 30s, people would use Mimeo or Ditto to publish fanzines, to publish their own newsletters with reports of conventions they went to or book reviews or just what's happening in their life to talk to other people who are similar, who have similar interests, but might not be around them. You know, one of the, the few really nerdy science fiction fans in your school, well, there's not many other people you can talk to, but if you find that there are people somewhere else that you can talk to and you subscribe to their, their fanzine and then you start writing letters of comment back to it and then you decide you want to start publishing your own because you've got a lot to say and it's just this innate human need to, to form communities and to find other people with your interests. Joining us now in the studio is Luba Levitsky, Educational Programs Marketing Manager with Control Data Corporation. Luba, we've heard about the Plato system from Control Data for a long time. What is Plato? Give us a little background on it. Basically, Plato is a highly interactive, graphic-based, individualized, computer-based education system. And by individualized, I mean self-paced, and, and the instruction is tailored to the needs of each individual student. Okay, you're online now with, with Plato on a, on a chemistry lab experiment of That's some right. sort, and, and show me what this does. Basically, this is, a, this is a simulation of a fractional distillation experiment, and it simulates operations and processes of an actual experiment 
Prior to this screen, the student has already touched the screen and assembled the distillation apparatus as they would in a regular experiment. The objective is to heat the still and to um, obtain a pure mixture of two chemical compounds. Lee Felsenstein, who was essentially the inventor of the portable computer, uh, ran this project in Berkeley called Community Memory, which was essentially a free BBS that you know, it was available in laundromats and things like that. And it was a real uh, meaningful uh, attempt at giving the population at large a way to communicate and, you know, online. A lot of inventions aren't, you know, an invention where one person comes up with an idea and goes off and builds it. A lot of inventions are where there's some idea that's becoming current, the technology's gotten up to a point where it's going to support it, a lot of people know there's a problem, a lot of people are working on it in parallel, a couple of them will come up with solutions, one of them will be able to get commercial success out of it, and, you know, so Thomas Edison's the one we know as the inventor of the light bulb. You know, the other people who are working on it the same time, don't get remembered. Randy Seuss and uh, Ward Christensen were, we think, as far as we know, the first ones to establish a bulletin board. 1974, I learned about microcomputers, and the 8008 was out at the time, and asked what I needed to know, and got into digital electronics and in 1975, the January issue of Popular Electronics had the Altair uh, computer on the front cover. And I thought, oh boy, I don't have to design and build my own computer from scratch. I can actually buy a kit and have the fundamentals. And uh, I didn't do it right away because I didn't want to be the only person with one. <laughs> Hard to believe that that's <laughs> now as universal as they are. So I, I went ahead and, uh, and bought an Altair. There was this computer club that was meeting in the Chicago area and CASH, the Chicago Area Computer Hobbyist Exchange. Um, and that's where I, uh, where I met Randy, and he was the real hardware jock. Uh, I was looking for something more to do. Mm -hmm. And then this damn thing called a computer came up. I had a F8 development kit. This is back before there was any idea of there being a personal computer. It was a little circuit board with a processor. I hand-coded things that would add from 1 to 10 and divide by 7. It was just absolutely amazing that you could make this little thing do that. We said, we had our own computer. Wow. Everybody's jaw dropped. Uh, I went to a Comdex show where Intel had a booth, and uh, for $300 you could buy a 8080 CPU right off the floor. And uh, I took that home and showed it to my wife, and I said, honey, look. Look at this. Do you realize what I can do with that? You can, you can see how seductive this must have been, because to have your own computer, I mean, it was really amazing, G given that they were multi-million dollar things that you had to share with everybody else. The idea of having your own was pretty uh, seductive. We had a unique problem uh, amongst us that we couldn't exchange uh, software through the various media formats that uh, everybody had derived independently. There was not one standard available between uh, things like processor technology SOLs to Altairs to MSIs to Chromemcos. It was just chaos.
January 16th, 1978, I went out to go to work and it had been snowing most of the night and I was unable to, uh, to get out because it just kept snowing and kept snowing. So I think I shoveled for like two hours and probably came in at like 9.30, 10 o'clock and, and realized I was not going to work that day. So I called Randy and I said, you know, I've got the computer club recorder where people can call to find out when the next meeting is and to leave questions and things like that. And why not take that line and, and put a system on it that people could upload newsletters and things like that, uh, newsletter articles and so on, and we could do a club project. And I remember uh, he, he said essentially that that was, sounded like a neat idea, but forget the club because you know what, what a, a committee run something will be. It'll take it forever to happen. I had too many years in the Navy to, uh, uh, to know, no, well, let's, not, let's not talk about it. Just do it. The two of us will do it. And you do the software and I'll do the hardware and tell me, when, you know, when are you going to have the software ready? You know, like a project manager. Uh... The reason everything worked out so well is that we just kind of inherently understood each other. He let me do what I did. I let him do what he did. It took me uh, about two weeks, probably about the end of the month, uh, before I uh, had some software ready to test. And uh, a little bit of playing around and let a few friends know it was there and try it and get some early feedback on things that it needed. And, and uh, uh, basically after, after the two weeks of, of designing and testing and put it online and refined it a little, and we called it a month. Uh, so February 16th became the sort of arbitrary uh, birth date of it. And, uh, and it happened so quickly because of Randy's uh, uh, brilliant initiative in, in pulling it back from being a club project, which would take forever and, and would be something more like the ARPANET that I had been in, which had a lot of people talking about a lot of good ideas, but nobody was just getting down and actually uh, turning, plugging in their soldering iron, so it wasn't happening. The whole BBS thing was for our computer club to be able to produce newsletters. That was the whole idea of it. It worked. From wherever it went from then, fine. And, uh, and that's how this beast uh, came out of it uh, and ran for many years. And I don't, I don't claim to have done anything special. And it was sort of like if you bring two more than half critical masses together, it's going to happen. And that was what was happening to the technology at the time. I found Ward System originally, CBBS Chicago, uh, mentioned in an article, I, if I recall, it was in InfoWorld. And I went, that's cool. And I called it. And played around on it and went, that's really cool. I used to read 80 Micro Magazine religiously every month. And one month uh, they brought out an article on bulletin boarding. We talked about a lot at the local computer club. And a lot of them had, had seen the, the stories on, on Ward System. It seemed like the same day we turned the thing on, it got its first phone call. Uh, and from there, just, you know, kept going. CBBS Northwest, isn't that a little pretentious? You're, you're kind, of cli kind of claiming this whole region, and you're, you know, you're, there's one system in this, you know, podunk, you know, section of Oregon. Uh, I said, well, hey, you know. When I named it, I was all there was, you know, this side of San Francisco, so. That's when I got up on Bill Blue's Bellflower RCPM, and he had the big bulletin board list, which at that time was about 100 bulletin boards. Downloaded that list and uh, started calling bulletin boards around the country, and it was always exciting. You never knew what was going to come up. Within two years, there was easily 200 to 300 phone numbers that you could call into, uh, the uh, RCPMs, the RBBSs, uh, the CPM net guys. You know, we, we celebrated 100 calls. It took us almost three months to get 100 calls on the bulletin board because nobody had modems. Very few people were in it, 
unless they either were active professionally in a related industry or perhaps had a lot of spare money. In the first phase, everybody was a computer hobbyist. You know, I'm one of these guys that my first computer came in a kit, cost me $3,000 in six months to put together. And you had to roll your own back in those days. Uh, an Altair 8800, really, boy, that was a machine you really had to build from scratch. It started becoming a surprise when I could find some of the parts that used to go into computers that show up at Radio Shack. Wow, you know, what's the world coming to? Well, the system operators in town were not computer hobbyists anymore. They were just, they would go out and buy or download a program, put the thing up. They had no idea how to program. They weren't interested in programming, which was fine. That was, uh, the interest had changed from computer hobbyists to uh, computer users. You could buy a TRS-80, download your friend's software onto it, and now I'm a BBS. No, they didn't have to know a damn thing. All they had to do was have a phone line and they could say they were a sysop. High schools were full of sysops. It's Crazy Eddie's greatest home computer sale ever. And Crazy Eddie's going home computer crazy with the absolute lowest prices anywhere on anything and everything in home computers. Atari, Texas Instruments, Commodore, even the new low price Timex Sinclair. Crazy Eddie's got them all. All the latest software too. Shop around. Get the best prices you can find on home computers. Then go to Crazy Eddie and he'll beat them. It's Crazy Eddie's greatest home computer sale ever. And Crazy Eddie's going home computer crazy. Crazy Eddie, his home computer sale prices are insane. Well, one summer I'm saving up my money for a jam box, you know, because I'm a teen and that's what you do. And I had a friend who took me to play computer games at this comic book store. I was a big comic book collector and I read in a Superman comic uh, where they had one of these sponsored insert comics inside the comic book. It was these two kids helping Superman fight some weather demon or something by using their TRS-80 Model 100 computer in some capacity to help them. And I came home and I said, you know that computer you've been telling me you wanted? We're going to get one now, and I'm going to put my money from the jam box towards this. And I just thought that was the coolest thing, that this computer actually was so powerful, it helped Superman. <laughs> I sold my uh, Atari 2600 in a box of cartridges to get my VIC-20. And because uh, of that, well, you know, I can invest in video games forever, but this is a computer. I think my dad got it because it made him feel like, my kids are smart, and so instead of getting them toys for Christmas, I should get them this. I used to, to copy and trade video games with my friends, um, which led to one of my buddies saying, hey, did you, do you know what a, a BBS is? And, and they're, you, know, you can get games for free and all this stuff on these boards. I mean, all I know is, is pirate BBSs. I'm just like, the idea of like, I'm talking to people and they could be anywhere and I don't know who they are. That's really neat. Even if a lot of them turned out to be really boring. <laughs> the evening of December 25th, you could, you know, for years, you could see, you know, this, some of the boards just got clobbered. Oh my God. Forgot it's the day after Christmas. <laughs> We're not going to get on any boards today at all. The, in fact, I think a lot of people will actually use this as one word. 12 year olds who got a modem for Christmas. <laughs> you had this mass of new callers that had no clue. And uh, I know a lot of boards, mine included, a couple of years, we'd actually close the system down to new users for the first two months out of the year. Go cut your teeth someplace else. We don't want to hassle them. For those of us who'd been there for many years, who'd had lengthy conversations as well as all the different types of interaction that had happened there, the, the sudden influx of Van Halen rules messages and, and the message counts just went through the roof because they were all very short one sentence, me too kind of messages. Their, their behavior just wasn't very adult-like and uh, they would really mouth off and bash people and steal their code and... Yeah, a lot of them were just pure anarchists too, you know, they just love creating chaos. It gave us a voice that no one had before. We had no idea what to do with it. You took sticks of dynamite and handed them to 12-year-olds and said, now, if you can find the lighter, you can make this go boom. And, well, we found the lighter. <laughs> there was a serious rift between any of the 8-bit users, between Apple, between Atari, between Commodore. I, I refer to them as Ford versus Chevy arguments. 
there was always this big argument between people who thought Chevy was the best car make and people who thought Ford was the best car make. And there were always this rivalry and this uh, uh, fight between them for what seemed like a completely pointless thing. People get really, really heated. They get very, very defensive of their computers. It's, it's not like you go and you buy a stereo or you buy a blender or a toaster. A computer is a very, very personal thing. It's, it's, it's an expression of how you want to work, how you want to do things. It becomes an extension of yourself and you, you tend to protect your, 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 your young, your own. Each had their own group of followers. Each group of followers was very faithful to the company they chose. Uh, well, Atari's were the best computers ever made. It's, forget it. It's the Apple II was the only software thing in town. The Commodore, I think, did more to get people into computers than anything else on the planet. When you thought of Atari, you thought of the highest quality, you know, the, the best games, the best, you know, the best of everything. So it made sense that, you know, if they come out with a computer, God, it's got to be the best thing around. The Apple was the ultimate hackable piece of hardware. The Lisa was beautiful, so I fell in love with Lisa. Tandy did have a great computer, which you may be talking about, the Coco, the, the color computer. Uh, the 64, it was everywhere. They're great, because they're the coolest. You understand what's going on with an Apple II. It's not going to trick you. <laughs> Nothing sneaky is going to happen on an Apple II. They break down, you put them in the closet, and they heal themselves. The Commodore is definitely the one that uh, I have like 10 of them at home, just in case. I'll have one till the day I die. And so they would invent in their own minds any justification to show that the other computer was a piece of crap. You know, we used to call the Apple people the blockheads because the, everything was in case. capitals. <laughs> <laughs> they never used their shift keys. Oh gosh, we hated Trash 80. And a TRS-80 guy would never own an Apple, and an Apple guy would never own a TRS-80. I think I didn't like the Commodores, just the way they were shaped. I, actually, IBM was kind of like the enemy. The Trash 80s were, were toys. I remember seeing people, you know, viciously attacking people non-stop in the message boards. They were people that I would actually follow a guy around and keep an eye on him and keep lashing out at him and on multiple, um, you know, bulletin boards. I mean, it really, it got that serious. If you were a Commodore user and you were on our bulletin board, it had to be because you told us you had an Atari or an Apple or a PC. We had zero tolerance for Commodore. And not for any practical reason, except for the fact that you have to delineate yourself from somebody else. We're the Commodore free zone. So that's what and, and, we were. So that was probably where a lot of the emotion came from. It's like, why, why are you making fun of my computer? You know, it's a computer just like yours is. But. This extended off of the bulletin boards, these, these, these wars, because you would walk into a store and you would hear some Commodore kid that would see somebody looking at an Atari computer getting ready to buy it and you go, you don't want that. It's, it, it's not powerful enough. It can't even run a disk drive. It can't run this. And I remember myself personally stepping up and going, you know, and getting involved in that and saying, you don't know what you're talking about, you know, we, we, we have robotic arms, we have Corvus disk drives, we have this, we have that, we have all these sorts of things, and you'd see the two people that were kind of looking at the computer, they'd be kind of like, you know, stepping back some way, like, you know, okay, let's, let's, you know, let's get out of here. One of the local electronic stores had set up a BBS that they were running out of their electronic store on this Amiga, and, well, that just would not do. <laughs> right. And so various people at various times would go up to the store and they would have this BBS just running on this PC and uh, they would disable that BBS. <laughs> just take the mouse ball, you know, just you know, yeah. remove the mouse ball, set it aside yeah. or do something. So now they can't do anything on their, on their computer. I remember him making threats against the sysop of that. Now, he was 16 probably and the sysop was an employee of the store. And he's like, you've got to take your board down or, you know, something bad is going to happen. I remember him coming home and saying, I just followed the guy home from work and I threatened him from my car and told him, you know, you got to take your board down. And I'm like, what in the world are you doing? And so then we, we stole the mouse yeah. ball from this computer and he posts this plea on the bulletin board. Please. Anybody who knows where my mouse ball is, because this is a time when you can't get replacement parts for the mouse balls. Anybody who knows where my mouse ball is, please let me have it back, you know. The biggest advantage it had that, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't put this to words then, but the biggest advantage was I had one. Being a natural pack rat, uh, I got a fundamental problem with pain to throw things away. It's bad enough to actually get around to finally throwing something away, but the pay to throw it away, that just hurts. I mean, like, for instance, you kept the manuals all this time. Oh, yes, of course. What is it without manuals? <laughs> I got all the manuals up there. 
Um, I've got, you know, printed out docs to my most used uh, shareware stuff. Um, oh, yeah. Keep the manuals. From where this thing got deposited, uh, gee, 10 or 15 years ago. It, no, 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 no. 15 or 20 years ago, more likely. But to work with my K-Pro, my Signalman 300 baud modem, which when I got it, I thought was the greatest thing going. And uh, even the speed didn't seem too slow, since the printer I had at that time was a 30 character per second uh, printer. So they were both about the same speed. And I used this for a couple of years until... Uh, 1200s finally became affo affordable. Okay, you want to describe what this is? Yeah, well, this this actually was a, a custom cabin a friend built for me. I had all these boxes of floppy disks. Each of these uh, each of these boxes holds 70 disks. Um, somewhere around here or so, they changed from 360Ks to 1.2 megs, um, and um, basically these disk here which numbers from 1 to 1800 um, are all shareware this is all DOS very little windows almost all DOS shareware um, that I collected from BBS's now the entire contents here fits on actually fits on two CDs I've put it on two CDs this station was about the most comfortable station for doing BBS's because in the slow BBS days, it wasn't that interesting watching, it was about as interesting as watching a dryer dry clothes, watching the numbers count. So my little TV set was over there, so uh, the children were younger then, and it was hectic upstairs. This was a place to get away from it all and uh, uh, do my uh, my BBSing with the printer right there and TV right there, and just sort of out of everybody's way. But, uh, and yeah. how much would you say you spent on this setup? You know... I don't want to know that. <laughs>I still have the paperwork on that Apple, and I look back at it, and it's like, we paid $3,600 for an Apple II and a printer and a monitor. And I'm just like, $3,600 now, I could you know, run half the country on the kind of computer you can buy for $3,600 now. I went to work at Carl's Jr. I mean, I, I hustled on all sorts of jobs, and I had the choice of getting a car or getting a computer. And I got a computer. And cool. then, I mean, the rest is history after that. Um, the first difference, the huge difference that, that's not, it'd be, it'd be trivializing it to overlook is the huge difference in speed. We're talking 300 baud, 300 baud. I'm glad I will never have to again. And by saying this, I'm cursing myself. I'll never have to deal with 300 baud again. In the bad old days, an acoustic coupler had two speeds. There was 110 baud. And there was a whopping 30 characters a second. 300 baud. And we thought that was pretty good. 300 baud. The screen wouldn't, you know, you stuff would, you'd log into a BBS and it'd be like, brr, 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 log in, or username, colon. And you'd type your username, hit return, and it'd be a pause and it'd go, password. And just the, how long it took to draw that stuff alone because of the speed issues was torture. When 1200 baud modems came along, the users all saying, you need to go to 1200 baud. And I said, 300 baud, that's reading speed. You know, we don't need anything faster than... And I was running a 1200 baud, baud modem and my, my shit just did not stink. <laughs> <I> was <so laughs> it was amazing when you actually connect to 1200. It was absolutely amazing. Called one of the few in town that supported 2400 baud, one of the few boards in town, and it was awesome. And you would actually seek out the place that had 2400 baud so you could take advantage of this high speed that you had. 
Even if the place sucked, it was just like, whoa, but look how much faster it's coming through. This is so cool. But I was always three, lowercase o, lowercase o, slash, 12, lowercase o, lowercase o, slash, 24, lowercase o, lowercase o, because I remembered the early days when I wasn't allowed onto some boards because I didn't have high enough baud rate. I remember the first time when I called up to a board and uh, a sysop pulled me in, in a chat and says, I got this new 9600 baud modem, man, and like, you're still 2400 and it's, it's sad, what's wrong with you? I probably got like $800 for my bar mitzvah from various people that added up to 800 bucks. I spent 650 of it on a 9600 baud modem. Um, which I thought was a good investment, 650 bucks for a 9600 baud modem, which of course, as soon as I bought that, they, they dropped down in price. And when I could get a 14.4 modem and download Doom to play with a kid who ran a BBS, because he couldn't find anybody to play Doom with him, that was just a, a wondrous device. Uh, one particular Saturday night, I'll never forget, I had company at the house who playing cards or whatever. This guy called me board and he's uploading something or other. And the next morning I woke up and he was still up on the same program. <laughs> when you found the big file and it was across the country, you really thought about it whether you wanted to download it now or take a chance on finding it locally. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Anybody who is probably under the age of uh, 30 or 25 these days has no concept of what the phone companies used to absolutely rape you for. For calling long distance. I mean, quite commonly, to call California during the day would cost you upwards of a dollar a minute. And that was in the deflated dollars of the day. Uh, I think the first month I got really into dedialing, we got a $500 phone bill. A lot of people like me did that and then ended up losing their telephone for a while because of the, thing, the, the $650 phone bill for one month. I mean, I never knew, right? I didn't know that uh, BBSs that were also in 312 could possibly cost any more money than one that, another one that was in 312 till we got the first phone bill. <laughs> My dad was very nice. He said, okay, this is a learning experience, <laughs> but you're not calling during, you know, prime time anymore. First of all, you're not staying online for eight hours anymore. Second of all. I mean, I was the expert on what the phone book, in the yellow pages, if you turn to the front of the yellow pages, they had all the plans laid out that you could get in Massachusetts. So we actually spent time saying, okay, you can call where, and where can I call? Okay, now that means we now have a combined calling area of this much. Pulled out page 17 from the yellow pages, which said, okay, if you live in this town, here's the, you know, this is what phone numbers start with, you know, that are local to you. So we used to figure out exactly where the bubbles lied and where they overlapped so that we could make those calls. So be like, okay, well, here's a page long of you know, numbers which I've got. All right, this one is 376. Okay, that one's good. You know, mark that off and I would call that one up. And I actually had to call Illinois Bell uh, when they were Illinois Bell and ask them for what they call a band chart. After dinner, I would go to my little hideaway downstairs, do my BBSing to the local BBSs, waiting for 8 o'clock. Then I'd hit the crosstown ones. Uh, on the weekends, I'd get up before, eight, when, before it went back and, and do a couple. Oh, yeah. It certainly has been, it's just been fun seeing the, seeing the progression. At this time, I can't believe BBS has ever ran on Apple II machines. <laughs> uh, I'm like, wow, that machine had like a megahertz. Not like a gigahertz, like a megahertz, like one. <laughs> Uno. It's, I don't know, you know what I mean today? It's almost like 
it's too easy. Computer today, computers are too much like a computer and less like a typewriter, like it was back then. So, and you don't have I love this. I miss the sound that you know you're typing. You know you're typing. It's gone from just building a computer that works is 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 an amazing thing to, oh yeah, I can build a computer. I want to make one that looks neat. <laughs> well, it was the beginning of a revolution. Yeah. Really was. Everything's been revolutionized since then. We don't typeset that we used to, we used to typeset. We don't do photography the way we used to do photography. You got this fancy XL1 camera with firewire and all this good stuff. I mean, it's it's I think there was a whole sense of adventure. We were doing something that had never been done before. We were taking hardware that had never been used for this kind of purpose and using it. And when I go into it explaining it, explaining what the BBS was about, why it existed, and what there was before the internet, everyone's just in awe. They're like, wait a minute, th there was something before the internet? Like, this just didn't happen? And, and it really just um, is a great way, or was a great way to spend hours and hours of, of your time just doing it. You know, the definition of a pioneer, that's the guy with all the arrows in his back. Well, that's, that's the way it was for the BBS guys. They broke new ground. They really blazed, they created a new empire. If it hadn't been for computers and technology, I would have probably died 20 years, 25 years ago, wrapping my car around a bridge abutment somewhere in Texas from drinking and driving or drugging and driving. I got into technology and I didn't have any mo more money for booze and for drugs. Those decisions have treated me very, very well. And I remember the first time I logged into a BBS and thought, you know, what the hell is this? And the answer was standing right behind my back. It was me 30 years later going, this is your life. Off into the lair. <laughs> Hope your Indiana Jones card is up to date. But, buried back here, under the piles, is the original CBBS Northwest system. Not in its original configuration right at the moment. I mean, I, I've still got all the cards, all the original cards, even the PM on my modem card is still rattling around in a box. But, the original CPU, the whole thing, the, that, that box, you know, for... 13 years just sat there pretty much happily and took phone calls. It certainly has been, it's just been fun seeing the, seeing the progression. The whole BBS thing was for our computer club to be able to produce newsletters. That was the whole idea of it. It worked. From wherever it went from then, fine. Just loaded the, uh, the BBS. My brother actually used to say, "Oh, are we gonna play loading again?" <laughs> he was used to his Intellivision, where he just pops a cartridge in. <laughs>